This is an oral history tape made with Trevor Prothero on the 10th of September 1996. He's in conversation with the Foundation archivist, Jill Roberts. Trevor, you were gardener, handyman, don't quite know really what, what yeah. to call it, but you, you, you worked here at, at Lee Court, the, the first Cheshire home, um, in the very early days. I think you came here about 1955. That's right. Um, tell me something about your first contact with Leonard Cheshire and his foundation. What made you want to come down here? The first contact I had was reading a magazine in the hairdressers in Manchester with my hair cut. And, uh, I was so impressed by it, I, I wrote away to see if they wanted anybody down at Staunton Herald. What, what was the article about? It was about the, mainly about the running of Lee Court itself in uh -huh. the old days, the starting of it. Mm -hmm. And how all the um, first people were working practically for nothing or as voluntary workers. And it seemed to be doing such a good job, I was really interested in what it was all about and wanted mm -hmm. to find out about it. Mm -hmm. So you wrote to Staunton? I wrote to Staunton, and then group captain passed my letter on to his father down here, to Professor Cheshire down at, down at Laundry Cottage. He was, he was chairman of the management committee down at Lake Court because they wanted a maintenance man who could drive and do some gardening, especially in the kitchen garden, and there was also a need for a relief cook. So we both could get involved in it. My wife was interested. She was quite keen. And and having lived in the country, we were very keen to get out of Manchester, was another reason beside the idea. So you came to Lee Court for an interview? Or? Came down for an interview, yes. In April. Stayed overnight down at the local pub. <laughs> and um, they gave us all the details, showed us the old, the old bungalow at the back. Um, it wasn't very interesting, <laughs> apart from the adder we saw on the step. An adder? An adder was on the step, giving <laughs> us a welcome. <laughs> oh, it didn't put you off? <laughs> didn't put us off, no. It was strange, I mean, everything looked so derelict up at the bungalow, it was a wonder we weren't put off. But anyway, we decided, we went back afterwards and we thought it all over, and we still decided to come and have a go. And we're very, very glad we did. Mm -hmm. When when did you come here for to, to actually start the job? Was that straight in away? May. In May, May, so straight yeah. away. Pretty yeah. well about a month in between coming down. Mm -hmm. Then when we were coming, uh, most of the staff was on the ch being changed over. They were uh, actually given notice to leave. <laughs> Why were the staff on notice to leave? Well, I think that um, the warden was quite a well, fairly young man. And they were having some sort of riotous parties with these voluntary students from Oxford and Cambridge were coming down here. And they, I don't know whether they got a bit out of hand or perhaps the professor was a little bit old fashioned and perhaps he thought, you know, the, those things weren't quite done those days. I mean, today nobody takes take the slightest notice, would they? Mm. So the, the professor was Professor Cheshire? Uh, That's the group captain's father, yes. Wh where, where was the group captain at this time then? He wasn't here? No, he wasn't here. I don't know where he was quite. Uh, before he went to India, anyway. Mm -hmm. Perhaps but he was at Amp Hill or, or the other. Been any one of the other homes, homes yes. round about. So it was all changed when you arrived. All changed. A whole lot changed. Even the and the worst part was that the maintenance officer or maintenance chap was leaving, Frank Reed, and uh, he was supposed to show me everything and didn't show me anything. So it was pretty difficult getting things going at first, but we overcome that fairly easily. Um, boilers were the biggest trouble. I had no knowledge of boilers at all. We never worked in a you know, looking after boilers, so I just I got the uh, the warden in was um, Commander Stevenson. So we talked to him and we got got him to get me a place up at Combustions Limited at Surbiton and done a course up there with them. Then I came back and after that I could sort of service the boilers myself, which was a great help. Right. The can I, I I'm right in thinking that um, Lee Court was quite new then. That they hadn't they, right, they moved in in 1954, I think, to the new building. Yes, so that's right. The maintenance 
must have been fairly um, smooth. The yes, new the, building, I yeah, would have thought. Yeah, the new building, that, that part was fairly smooth. The boilers were, were, were fairly new, but the thing was, they went wrong even then in those days, and no one knew what to do with them. Right. Just previously to that, they'd had about 11 days in the winter time mm. without any heating or anything because the engineer, one engineer was down in Cornwall, another up in Manchester, another down in mm. Wales, and they had to wait 11 days before they. <coughs> before they came back. So we overcame that by going up to Surbiton and, and they're very good up there. They gave me loads of spare parts and all sorts to mm -hmm. come back with, which saved quite a bit of money for the home. Mm -hmm. What other jobs did you do? Oh, garden, and they had the kitchen garden. I used to get stuck into the kitchen garden. Dug, I had no um, tractors and dig it up, I dug it up by hand most of the time. Planted beans and peas, you know, normal. Anything that would go in the kitchen, sort of usual vegetables. No time to do anything fancy. Cut the grass. Uh, it's about nine acres altogether. Tremendous the, amount the of yeah. land, yeah. Cut, yeah. The, cut the grass and um, do the driving and as well in between times, going down to the church. Take residents used to go down to the church about twice every twice a Sunday or every morning, Sunday morning anyway. Take them down about twice on a Sunday. Really working seven days a week to keep on top of the grass, cutting in the summertime and he was very, very busy but um, I don't know. We really enjoyed it, so that was the main thing. Mm -hmm. And your wife was cook? She was doing anything, yeah. She was in the kitchen for a, about two years when we first came. Then they asked if she'd go on to um, care work. Mm -hmm. Then she was doing night, uh, looking after the nights as well for a long while. Mm -hmm. um, she was sort of fit in anywhere, do anything. Cleaning or no matter what it was, she was quite willing to have a go. <coughs> <coughs> one time she was doing care, doing the night staff work on her own. Uh, well, they only used to have one care uh, night staff on mm -hmm. at that time. That looking after 39 residents then. Of course, now they're 50. Mm. Still, even 39 is a, a big, big yes, number. Yeah. The mm -hmm. difference then was that they were sort of four in a room or two in a room, and there were nothing less than two in a room. Some and others was usually four in a room, so mm -hmm. it wasn't quite so, you know, quite such a stressful job of getting round to mm. to see to them all and they things used to seem to work out all right. Do you remember the residents particularly in the early days? Frank Spath? Frank oh yes, I remember Frank. Yes. Yeah. yeah Frank was a great man with with his uh, if we went to London Railway and Frank was the man to go with you. If he, Frank would get up the front and Frank had his maps in front of him. But Frank would guide you anywhere in London or anywhere for that matter. He's you you never met Frank, of course you went no, back before. No. Incredibly, he used to have his long chair and sit back and he couldn't whatever well, he could see and he'd have his map out there and he's, he he had um, very bad rheumatoid arthritis. His fingers are all twisted up but even so he he could always pen and he would he'd sing out, you know, left ear or in the middle lane <laughs> going to London for me being stranger to well at that time I'd seen London was quite a strange place for me. It was ideal for get Frank up the front, we go anywhere. Because we'd do a lot of trips up to Festival Hall and mm -hmm. um, to different places in London, mm -hmm. Albert Hall, mm -hmm. up to the, the Earl's Court and places mm -hmm. like that. The trips are you know, quite quite well catered for in that particular particular mm -hmm. line. They were well looked after the residents. Mm -hmm. Do they do they used to organise these themselves? They used to organise themselves, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the early days we used to we used to have a collection amongst ourselves to pay for the petrol because <laughs> things was pretty tight, you know, things yeah. was tight like everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But now they've got, what, three traffics on the big bus mm. and everything's organised, they can get out and it's wonderful really how, how things have developed over the years. Do you remember the volunteers who used to come? Do you oh remember yeah. Ron Travers? Yes, Ron. He, when he Ron, I remember Ron when he was a boy. <laughs> Straight from the he BBC. Came, well, before the BBC, yeah, he came here as a boy to uh, help out. I didn't know Good that. Cat. Yes, he was here before, before the BBC. Oh, no, I thought his first contact no, was No, no, he was 60. working at the... He was coming here as a voluntary worker at Lee Court. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Remember Ron when he first came. I remember him taking his first driving lessons. How old was he when he first came? Oh, Lord, he was quite young then. I couldn't can't quite remember. He was mm. only a youngster, you know. Mm. And he, of course, went on to become international director of... Of, of overseas. Uh, yes, yes. Of, of the Marvelous, foundation yeah. and, uh, and GC's right-hand 
Mount. Yes, that's right. Oh, Ron, I to have a long chat with Ron when we meet up. <laughs> were there many great characters? Yes. Were there, were there many volunteers? Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Dimbleby, Richard Dimbleby, you know, Ron is married to, mm -hmm. to, um, what's her name? Dillis. Dillis, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dillis was working there for years. Uh -huh. um, that's where the Ron and her first sort of met, I suppose, mm -hmm. in, a, in a roundabout way. Then they used to go on holiday. We used to take the residents up to Caister and way, uh, down to Weymouth. They first started with Peter Wade in the early days. Mm -hmm. He sort of organised um, holidays for young disabled. That was one of the first ones. We went down to Poole and we started going up to Galston mm -hmm. and then up to um, Caister. Mm -hmm. Dillis and Ron, they used to come up as voluntary workers. Richard Dimbleby was alive then. He used to come up in his Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> he used to come up there quite often. And David and Jonathan, they used to put in a pair of up here. I remember them quite well. <laughs> they got on well. <laughs> That's going back to 60s, I yes, suppose. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. They've sort of moved on in life since them days. Well, they're way well known now, aren't they? Oh, Lord, yes. They've done very well. They're very good. Um, well, like the father, weren't they? He was a great, very nice man. Mm -hmm. Great journalist. Yes, mm -hmm. great journalist. Great speaker. So, just going back a bit, Professor Cheshire, you, men you mentioned him briefly as being here in charge to a certain extent yeah. when you started. Yeah. Did you have much contact with him? Yes, every week, every... Um, I, I, I got asked to go over there after about... We'd been here about 12 months in a gardener. They had a gardener. Over where? Over where? Over Laundry Trevor. Cottage, where a group captain owns Laundry Cottage. That's just up the drive. Uh huh. Right. And the group, um, Professor Cheshire moved down there in 1944. I think it was 43. Um, group captain was the old building was going, and he was things was a bit, well, a bit mixed up. I think with the <coughs> with the. Um, TB patients and the, the odd people kept coming in. And this must have been late 40s, 1948. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and the professor got really worried about what was going on. So he decided, because he had, had his place at Greystones, and near, which is outside of Oxford. I went up there a few times. I drove up to Oxford a few times, and he, we had always had to go by Greystones to have a look at it. Grey walls? Grey walls, Grey rather, walls. not Greystones. Grey mm. walls. He, because they, re they practically built it, the group captain and did? The, mm. himself and the other, and, uh, the other brother. Yeah. They built it themselves pretty well. We all, always went around that way. Now I got in, asked if I'd go down there sort of weekends and do a bit of gardening, keep the place tidy, wash the cars and anything to, you know, anything they wanted to do, which I did. And then it, I was only supposed to have gone until they found themselves a gardener, and they ended oh, as for about 23 years until he died. Very temporary, though. <laughs> Very temporary. <laughs> I couldn't have been too bad. They got rid of me before oh, then. No. A good <laughs> reference, I think. Group captain's mother was alive then, Prim Primi Primrose. She was a lovely lady. She was, I forget how long she was alive when I was there. I remember when she died quite suddenly, one sort of about. Daffodil time. Mm -hmm. Is it 1960, I think? Something or about it. Something I don't like quite, can't quite remember the date it's she died. Or mm -hmm. Then Professor was on his own for a couple of years and um, very lonely for a long spell until uh, he met Dame Mary Lloyd, who lived in Hailing Island, and next door neighbour was chairman of the committee at the period of time, Sir Christopher Lake. He introduced her to Lee Court, and that's how she met the uh, Professor. I remember quite well the old professor used to nip off sometimes in the evening and wouldn't say where he was off. He usually used to tell me where he was going, but he used to nip off and say he was going off for a few hours. And then eventually it came out that he was going down to see Dave Mary. Uh -huh. And in, well, less than about two and a half years, I suppose, they decided to get married. And she, she, lost, she lived with him for about nine years. She had she had a fall going down the drive one winter time, walking down from Lee Court from one of the committee meetings. She was going down the old drive, and there was ice in the road, and she slipped up and she fell bang on her back. Mm -hmm. And the specialist said that that started off um, the rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And she suffered very much. She was, she not, not the first few years, she didn't notice it, but then it gradually took over. 
in the end she could hardly walk at all but they were very very happy together they had long spells with the professor t going up to London to the Nuffield and down to Bath he used to go every weekend he used to, I used to drive him pretty well everywhere he used to drive himself as well but weekends and other I used to drive him down to Bath and different various places what was he like? And he was a great man was oh he? wonderful mm -hmm. real gentleman mm -hmm. No, no airs, no graces, but um, we used to have long, especially after Dame Mary died, I used to go over, I was supposed to be over there working, and many times I used to spend hours in just talking to him, because mm -hmm. he was very lonely. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing I always remember, no matter what he told you, he, I mean, over the years we talked about dozens of things and places he'd been to, he never really seemed to repeat himself. You know, like old people, <laughs> probably myself, I expect one day, they repeat themselves, don't they? It's a sort of thing with old people. But the professor, you'd never, never hardly ever, I don't ever remember him. And I was so amazed by this marvellous memory, because he was 93 when he died. But when I was, you know, he's sort of well into his 80s and that, when I was, well, the whole time I was there, 23 years. So he going back 70 on 70 odd when I went there first. Mm. But he never repeated himself. You know, he used to tell you the places he'd been to and when they went and holiday to get himself and Primmy or himself and Dame Mary, but he'd never sort of tell you the same story or because marvellous gift. What did he used to talk about? Holidays and No, oh, well, all kinds of things in his life because he was bursar at Oxford, Exeter College at Oxford. And then he was working in up at uh, the law courts in London. I mean many a time they used to send special messages big courts good big court cases going on in London. They'd send a special messenger down here with loads and loads of papers. Tied up with ribbon. Yeah, that's right. For the <laughs> professor, to have his, um, he'd have to read them all through and then give his verdict. You know, he was more or less giving the giving the judge or giving whoever the or the solicitors or whatever they were would send him, sending them down QCs. They were then anyway, all big cases. Of course, mm. he would give his verdict, and that went back to London, and they took his advice from there because he was a big pal of the Lord Denning as well. Mm -hmm. Lord, Lord Denning, Denning used to come down here as well one time. Well, yes. he, they were both. They were both the first trustee, one of the first trustees, trustee, weren't that's they? right, yes. yes. Mm. Yeah. That's what, because, I say, he got worried about what was going on with these parties, and that's when he decided to move down here to keep an eye on things. <laughs> he all said, group cup, there was no... He said, you know, he's probably done and been a marvellous man in the RAF, he said, but he's no... Uh, what, did he, what was his words he used? He was no accountant. He's <laughs> no, I don't think GC would suggest he was an accountant. No, no. <laughs> he said he, he <laughs> used to make me laugh. He said he, he you know, he, his idea of accounting was <laughs> just, just get it and w don't worry about paying for it. Just get it and be, you know, carry on like. The professor was highly amused with that. Did he say anything else about his son, GC? That is. What did uh, he think about the work he was doing? Oh he? yes, we mm -hmm. thought that was wonderful. He mm -hmm. thought, you know, he was he was right into it himself because he did mm -hmm. a lot of work on the committee up here and got lots of things improved and moving under his own under his own with his own efforts. Mm -hmm. But he he was, you know, we really thought. I mean, he, well, he was a marvelous man. There's no two ways about it. But uh, he really uh, thought the world of Group Captain. They got on very well. He used to always come down and get his father's advice. So. Mm -hmm. They used to spend hours talking together in the study. So I think his parents were quite worried about GC, weren't they, when he first left the RAF? He yes. He didn't quite know what to do with his life. He certainly didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember his dad and his mum went in that grey walls. Group captain was in the RAF. And he appeared in a great big four-seater open, open tour of car one day. And he, this is when the war was on, or just... Some some period you and then he said, Oh, come on, Dad, you go for a ride. His dad, father said, What do you mean go for a ride? There's a petrol ration and we got no petrol. We've got, I've got no petrol to go riding about. He said, No, in this, he said, the staff car. In uniform. So his father said, But, you know, we can't, we can't go riding. He, oh, yes, we can. He said, Jump in. So they both jumped in, Mum and Dad. And the. Um, American Air Force was stationed at, at Abingdon. They had a big place. Is there a place at Abingdon now, isn't there, I think? Yes, I think there is. Yeah. Yes. And uh, the, RAF, the, the American Air Force was there, just their part of it. Group captain drives up to the, to the petrol pumps, goes in, 
drives into the half into the station, into the RAF, well, not the RAF, the United States Air Force Station. Mm -hmm. Mark drives in and gets saluted on the way in. Drives up to the petrol pumps. They had a place for filling up the cars and or the staff cars or whatever inside. Drives up and the young man appears and spoke to him. Yes, so we'll just fill her up. Well, you know, just fill her up. Whatever this, what do you call this, corporal or whatever was on duty. This chap. So uh, fills it up and he's got just signs a chip and they drives off. <laughs> his, his father was terrified. He thought he thought they were going to get locked up straight. You know, never heard no more about it. <laughs> Went in and out of the air, oh yeah, from the American Air Force place, just like that. Another <laughs> time he said he had a after the war he had a mosquito. He I don't know whether he owned it or he borrowed it or whatever. Anyway, it appeared one day and he said, come on, Dad, so we go take it for a fly around. He said, this was because it was stationed at Abingdon, the airfield was there. Mm -hmm. So he said to Dad, come on, Dad, so we go for a flight, go for a little fly around. But Dad, after some thought about it, he went decided to go with him. He said they ended up in France. <laughs> <laughs> no papers, no clearance papers, no nothing, over the channel down in France. <laughs> then they got... They got um, they got told off the landing there. We thought we was going to be locked up with the in you know with the police over there. Mm. Anyway, they, when they found out who they were, they had a good lecture and then they sent them back to England. When they come back here, yeah, they got another good lecture because <laughs> they got no landing no landing papers, no whatsoever. That was group captain. No, they were not a lover of authority. <laughs> not a bit. No. no. <laughs> I remember telling me he had a they, well, group, group captain told me as well. He had a he had a little two-seater sports car. That's when he was a student at Oxford. He, of course, he was one of the lucky ones to get a car. I suppose because Dad was fairly well off. And uh, himself and two others. There was a big roundabout near Oxford somewhere, and they decided to have a bet on who could go round the most times without being stopped round and round this roundabout like fools. <laughs> All for about a pound, a pint of beer or something like that. Mm. Some stupid dare. <laughs> What about um, Primrose Tasha, GC's mother? Did you meet Lovely her? Lovely person, yes, mm. yes. Mm. She was, she was sort of, you know, she was well into her seventies when I when I first went over there. But uh, yeah, she was a very, very sweet-natured person. Mm. Mm -hmm. But thought the world of group captain. Mm. Yes, I think GC had a, a close relationship oh, yes. with his parents and yeah, with both with, <coughs> parents. with both parents mm. and his stepmother as well. I yes, think. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Coming to GC himself, you must have seen a lot of him over the years. I know that there's correspondence in the archive between you and him about maintenance matters, tennis court, and oh, yes, things yes. like that. What What was your impression of him as a person? Oh, wonderful, full of humour. <coughs> no idea when he was when he was when he was serious or when he was pulling your leg. <laughs> like the time he came down and asked me. I was cleaning professor's shoes one Saturday afternoon and he came along and he said, would you mind cleaning a few pairs for me? I said, certainly, S certainly, sir, I said, there you I used to sir, and he always told me not to call him sir, just GC. Then towards the latter end, we just called him Leonard every time I saw him, that was a privilege. And um, I said, certainly. So he so I said, how many sort of without thinking, said, how many pairs you got? And he said, oh, about 32. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I quite, I was so serious about it, I quite believed him. It took about half an hour afterwards, and he came out and he said something about these shoes and started laughing, and then he was pulling my leg. <laughs> he was always pulling people's legs, always, met, you know, pulling, having jokes at, at himself very often as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was he, um... <coughs> What was he like to work for as an employer? Oh, wonderful. Could be could could be quite strict if he wanted to be, which was a good thing. But I didn't have a, but, you know, didn't have much dealings with me because he didn't actually deal with Lee Court as such. With Lee Court was work. He had the warden at Lee Court, and I worked under the warden. But the only work that I did for him was when he was working for his dad, and uh, I used to drive him round one one stage when he came down. I he hadn't got a show for that. So I used to do quite a lot of driving for him the weekends, or even Lee Court used to give me time off to take him around various places. Well, we went, once went down to um, Wiltshire, down to Blynham, where he's guest of honour down there. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I remember him sitting in the back of the car with his feet up. He had a, I forget now, quite a big one of the big Austin cars. Mm. I was driving away and he could hear him nattering away and I said, Pug, oh, he says, all right, I'm, only, I'm dictating some letters because he's got a dictaphone, which I didn't realize what it was, but he was sitting in the back and I should think he must have dictated about 20 or 30 letters yeah. on before we got anywhere near Wiltshire. Mm. Mm. And they were going, I mean, I couldn't help but hear what he was speaking in that. I mean, they were going to India and mm. Canada, the High Commissioner of this and the High Commission of, of, of India and all these different places. I was amazed. Mm. And he told me that he sent that back to London and then they typed it all out and sent it off for him. Mm. We had a wonderful day down at Lynham at lunch with the officers' wives and um, he was guest of honour because the officers' wives at Lynham had collected some money to equip a room at, at the Great House, mm -hmm. you know, which, uh, down there mm -hmm. near Lynham, with um, all hi-fi equipment, about three or four hundred pounds worth. <coughs> the idea was we had a, a group captain who was guest of honour for the day at up at Lynham and then we would go down to Great House and he was going to officially open the room for them. Mm. So we had lunch up at Lynham and then we went oh we went all over the all of the station and then they showed us how quickly they could load up a, a Hercules, one of these great big Hercules transports. They showed them how quickly they could load it up with these all the rollers. They could be staging with old rolls and they can fold in great Mm -hmm. Great big crates about two ton or more in weight just roll them in as easy as wink. Mm -hmm. Then the main thing was they had to set aside a, they had a Hercules with the engine running. Quite quite knew where we were. And <coughs> I'd said to him previously, I said, I don't suppose you'll be going up. He said, Oh no, they won't lay on it, anything like that on I said. So he said, Why? I said, Well if you're going up, I said, any chance to come up with you? I was only joking. Anyway, he spoke to the to the com commander guy, I think, I forget his name now, he's a famous international referee as well, the, mm -hmm. the commander of the station. And he came over and said, well, if you go up at your own risk, he said, well, I said, all you lot are going up, so <laughs> I wasn't going to say no. So we went up in the Hercules. The idea was to fly over Lynham, over uh, Greathouse rather, fly around and fly low over Greathouse and take some pictures from the air of, of, the, of the home. But the cloud ceiling was too low, so we couldn't get any pictures, but we went around for about 20 minutes, I suppose. Mm -hmm. These two young lads, two young pilots, they must have only looked about 18 or 20, that, uh, well, 18, 19 at the, uh, at, the, at the least, I should think. Mm -hmm. And um, we were up on the flight deck. I was stood one side, and the group captain stood the other side, and the commander was standing just behind me, and he said, right, we'll do a short takeoff. And we could see the, the airfield, uh, that the, the, uh, when they take off, it's about three miles mm -hmm. long, you mm -hmm. know, the runway rather. Mm -hmm. And if I thought, oh, let's go way down there before we get off the ground, this massive great thing. You know, they're about 500 yards and they pull the stick back and the commander said, hang on, because we went up fairly steeply, it goes up straight up in here. <laughs> anyway, that was great. And group captain was, it was interesting here because we had a whole of these earphones and the intercom and you could hear him speaking to the lads. And they were asking him, he, he was telling them that he was, used to fly Lancasters, and they said, well, do you, how do you fancy flying this? And he says, no thanks, he said, because it's all computerized. Mm -hmm. And he said, they wouldn't have a clue, he said. He when said, when was this? What year was this? Oh. 70s? Yeah, about 60, 68, 70, something mm -hmm. there. So it was computerized even for yeah, that part? Yeah, yeah, those they were. Mm -hmm. with a, the plane. They had their little, like a little television set in the front, and they could mm -hmm. see everything in this. Mm -hmm. But they, they looked like two farm, two farm lads with just green overalls on. <laughs> they took it up off the ground and they brought it down and when we up to the clouds you could hear the ground control saying exactly, they tell them exactly where we were coming into land, they said you had so, so many, you know, like yards, whatever it was they were speaking in, and you'll be on the end of the runway and we come through the clouds, spot on the end of the runway mm -hmm. and they brought it down like it was uh, Austin 7 or something, I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Had a wonderful day, but no, he's great, but great day out. Mm -hmm. Then we went down to Lynham and he opened the room for the, for the ladies down there. <coughs> of course, everybody, oh, wherever he went, everybody was, you know, they all, everybody wanted to see him, that was the main thing. It must have been very tiring, very oh, tiring terribly tiring. for him. Yeah. I remember one time he was down here, we had tried to take him, he had lots of meetings down in Bournemouth and Southampton, and one meeting after another, and he had to get up and 
you know, make speeches at all these meetings. Mm -hmm. Must have been terribly tiring. Mm -hmm. I used to just sit out in the car and play the radio until he come out. <laughs> Did you ever see him? Did you ever see a bad side of him, a downside of him? So many people say. <coughs> Um, what a wonderful man he was, and of course he must have been. I never met him myself, but everybody has off days. And oh yeah, had off days. About. Yeah, I remember him once. He, he said, I went down there and uh, I thought he wasn't in very good, didn't look in very good form, because I used to go over and uh, he was always in the study, always either reading his Bible in the morning, as he always was, wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Always read a uh, chapter or two out of the Bible. And then he used to sit there and sort of contemplation. I used to take the papers over and when he was in residence up here, because he used to come and stay for weeks at a time very often. At Laundry Cottage. At Laundry Cottage for mm -hmm. a rest, have a break, get away from everywhere. That was his hideaway. That's his, that's what he used to tell me, he was his little hideaway. This particular morning, <coughs> he looked a little bit annoyed and um, he said, um, Feeling his firewood, did you say? Yes. Somebody had been telling him porkies, I think, for some reason, but why he believed it, I don't know. Uh, he said, yes, he said, Anthony's been stealing my firewood. Well, the funny part was, Anthony was living in a flat down at Gretham, and he'd only got gas central heating, so he had no need to put firewood. So he, and I waited and listened to what he had to say, and I said, excuse me, sir, he said, but I said, I think, you know, somebody's been telling you porkies, I said, because Anthony's got sent gas central heating. I said, he wouldn't want to steal your wood anyway. I said, if for that matter, I've got tons of wood. Across, across the other side of the road from my place, I said, which I bought off Chippy Carpenter. So he, he didn't. He took a long time to get over it. He didn't actually believe me. Then he did. Then a couple of weeks after, he did apologise and said that he was mistaken. I said, because I, I said, well, if you like, come down and see Anthony's flat. I said, it's only down in Gretham. I said, you'll see. I said, yeah, I haven't even got a fireplace. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. He really got his back up that particular morning. Mm -hmm. That's about the only time I think I've seen him getting annoyed when things. Had old Lee caught something had gone wrong with something, he could get a bit cross at times then, which mm -hmm. was only natural. But I've never seen him really lose his temper and let fly at anybody. Really? No. Right. He was mm -hmm. wonderfully sort of self controlled. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I remember once we had a memorial service up in London for one of the staff, I can't remember her name, that's going back in the early days. Young lady died of cancer quite quite young. And we went to Carmel, no. No, not Carmel. No, 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 we no, went no Margo. No, no, Margaret. No, this was a young girl who worked for the um, worked at Market Muse. I know, I know, I can't think of it. Yeah. Yes. And we went to Westminster Cathedral, and the group captain got up in the pulpit, and you'd have thought he was, you know, he was the regular preacher. He Toner, spoke, Maggie Toner. Toner was it? Yes, Maggie mm -hmm. probably was. I couldn't remember her name. I think that was it. But I, it gave us the most wonderful. Three quarters of an hour, I should think he stood up there, never looked at no notes, no nothing, and he just talked and he, he, he explained her, you know, her, her background and what a wonderful person. And the, but the way he spoke, and he's, he's a marvelous speaker. Mm. He's such a, such a character, such a way of putting things over, and his mm. voice is so good at speaking. I mean, he's really he was a wonderful person as a, as a speaker in that sense. He could have made a good priest, I would have thought. Mm. <laughs> Other people have said that. Yeah, mm. you sh he could have been a priest quite well. Mm. But they are, you know, those those things stick in your memory for always. Mm. I think talking earlier, Trevor, you were saying that in many ways you feel that a lot of the things you'd learnt in your life before you came to Lee Court seem to be preparing you for this. Do you, yes, do you well, still feel that? Still think I still think that because um, there are so many things that I that I did before, or done before, like learning driving coaches, getting passing my test to drive double deckers and things like that in Manchester, and being involved in electrical work in in tra in Metropolitan Vicars in Trafford Park, and uh, then I worked for a builder doing painting and decorating. All these things I've done up at Lee Court. I mean, I've done years of work decorated every room in the place from time to time I expect but you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, always been a been a, a good gardener anyway or fairly good gardener you know Mark, mm -hmm. not the, just only kitchen garden but mm -hmm. always been involved in that so everything that I had to do up here I'd sort of done before and it all came in so useful mm -hmm. really really uh, helped out and it came e easily to me the driving was no problem at all the only thing I was stuck with, with was just boilers but <laughs> we got over that fairly well. Yeah. 
So it all seemed to be leading up to it. All seemed to leading up to this, and I mean, I, I still can't fathom out for the life of me why, after seeing the, the old bungalow where we were going to live, I mean, there were rat holes in the floor, and the fireplace had been taken out and left over. If anybody else had seen it, they would have said he was completely nutters. <laughs> But we took it as it was, and it's you know, everything improved from then, and still, well, things are still improving. Mm -hmm. Well, Trevor... Because I was there, uh, Ian, I don't know what he wants to say anything about the... Um, his, I was there when he, the night of the fire, when he... He was down here at the, at the fire, when he... He had motor neuron disease, and obviously... We're talking about um, the GC, the early in the year of yeah, death. Just, there yeah, was a fire yeah. at Laundry Cottage. That's yes, right. please tell, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah the, night, the night before the fire, or the night of the fire, rather, he came to learn to leave court. I used to take... Sometimes I'd take his... Um, I was down here, but very often I went up to leave court and got some sandwiches. He used to ring me up and ask me if I'd take, some, take a lunch over for him. But this particularly night he didn't ring up I knew he was coming so I went over to see him and uh, the door was door was unlocked so I went in as I normally did and shouted are you there GC and I always got oh, Leonard I used to call him because he always you know years in the latter years he's always called me Leonard I shout you there Leonard so he was up in bed so he said yeah I'm going to lie down Trevor he said I'm rather tired so I said oh right I went upstairs I knew where he was right upstairs to see him and I said, you're all right? And he said, yeah, not too bad. I said, I'm very tired. I'm just going to have a lie down. So he said, do you want anything? No, he said, I don't want anything. So uh, I said, you sure I get you nothing? Cup of tea, nothing? No, I didn't want nothing. So I said, okay, see you in the morning. So he said, all right. So apparently I see him next, in the afternoon, because he was taken to the hospital next morning. The ambulance, you, you probably know how he got out for the window. I've read the newspaper yeah. reports, that's all. Mm -hmm. He got out. See, what happened, he told me afterwards, what happened was he heard some banging and crashing. And of course, he got burglar, burglar alarm on the building. But this banging and crashing, he thought, was somebody had got inside. Mm -hmm. we're, in, we're outside in the passage. So he opened the door. Of course, it was what the banging and crashing was, all the timbers were falling down because Laundry Cottage is it's two buildings, one like that and one a bit lower like that, connecting the at the back where the fire was, they, the, all the roof was caved and he opened it. was it. as bad as that? Oh yes, all the roof yes. went right, the one, on the one section, which is the lower section, mm. the roof went right through and unfortunately it didn't go into the top lot, top side, which faces mm. the road. Mm. But um, he opened the door and of course he was met with a, with, with, with a great, and he went to switch the lights on, the lights had gone because uh, the blanket, this electric blanket he'd put on for Gigi was coming down next morning coming down from to stay with him over the weekend. You know, you know, Gigi, yes, of course. Yes. And uh, she was coming down. That's, he that's got his daughter. Yeah, yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. And he came, she, she was coming down. He got this old blanket out of the cupboard. And it was an old one, I suppose, been folded up and, you know, they get brittle. And blankets, you know, electric blankets, I mean, unless they're laid out, they want to be sort of fairly flat. And I suppose it had been bundled up and got, the wires had got probably perished, been an old one. He put the blanket on to warm the bed for her to, he, to sort of air the bed. And what had happened, this thing shorted out in the night. And of course, that it did outside, so I don't know whether, why the fuse didn't just blow and it went, and it, um, the, the heat went out of the blanket. I don't know, but it might have, the fuse might have been too big. You know, the mm -hmm. days it weren't so particular as they are today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you only want a sort of a one amp or two amp fuse at the most in an electric blanket. Mm -hmm. Anyway, way it went, caught the bed clothes. And then all the electric went off. But that was in his part of the house, it must have been. Yes. In so the fire started the very close to him. Yes, he was in this, the three bedrooms in the front of the house, and there's one at the back in the corner. That was the one that Gigi used, usually had for herself. So it was in this lower part of the building. So GC opened the door. There, were no, there was no lights. No what? lights. The, the, what had also, also happened, he he pulled out the unplugged his telephone and said he wouldn't be bothered because he was really tired and he pulled the plug out of the telephone you know the little you could pull them out and just plug them in mm. and of course he was met with these could see the flames once he opened the door mm. and the smoke came in so he shut the door quickly and he managed to go back to the he found his way back to the bed and he knew the telephone was plugging in at the back behind the bed and he couldn't find his torch he was feeling around in the dark and he pushed the so he found the end of the 
the teleport, he followed the wire and found the end of it and plugged it in and called the fire brigade. And then he kept as low as possible. He was quite, he was quite with it. Mm. He kept really low down because of the smoke. He opened the window. Over the front door, there's a little ledge over the front door. So he opened the window in the bedroom and he got out onto the ledge and he shut the window behind him and he, he was sitting on the ledge and he sat there until the fire brigade came. But he had inhaled some smoke and he had with him only having one lung because he lost the one lung as you know and of course they took him off to uh, took him off to, to Basingstoke Hospital anyway he came back in the afternoon and he, we had to talk he was told me what was happening and that was probably the last time I saw him but he went off then and he never did he he, he, no that's right he came back that afternoon and that was the last time we see him because um, mm. he was more or less because I think he must have known he'd got motor neurons mm. when he, then, but he didn't. He never told me that. I think he, he did have, know he, then. He must yes. have known it then because mm. he and he was so unusually tired and he'd lost mm. he'd lost his old vitality a bit. Mm. I thought there was something wrong with him. Mm. And then after that, of course, he was in hospital and sort of went down and down. And then he went off to India, didn't he? Yeah. With, yeah. In May. Yes, mm. that's right. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But that was a you know real great loss. That was because we. He was lucky he didn't lose his life in the fire, but um, having to lose it with the, with the motor neuron disease afterwards, that was a very real blow to everyone, of course. Yes, yes, yes. But like he said, he did, well, he did, he spoke to him once or twice, and he said, well, he said, I know what it's like now to sit inside, you know, the other side in a wheelchair, like, mm. I know both sides now, but mm. it's incredible mm. after all he'd done that why he should end up in a wheelchair like that. Mm. And it's, uh, yeah. It's almost like Providence, isn't it? It is yeah. indeed, yes. Yeah. Wonderful man, no doubt about it. Well, Trevor, thank you very much indeed. Well, if that's any help, good. You're Thank welcome. You.